A colourful resident of the New World forests, Puki Puki was one of the beasts first discovered by guild expeditions to these new lands. Not especially hostile, nor a lethal challenge for more experienced hunters, it can be easy to forget this bizarre bird wyvern outside of its unique appearance, but its behaviour and ecology may hold several clues to give us more information about the history of the ancient forest. One of the behaviours from the extended lore that we sadly don't get to see is that Puki Puki is a brood parasite. For those uninitiated with their ornithology, this is the term for a bird that lays its eggs in someone else's nest and lets them do the parental care. The most well-known family for doing this is of course the cuckoos. Whilst not all cuckoos are brood parasites, and not all brood parasites are cuckoos, they're without doubt the flagship of the behaviour. There are two types of brood parasite, evictors and non-evictors. Evictors fling everyone else's eggs out. Non-evictors let them stay, but can often outcompete their chicks later. Of the suite of behaviours across the various species involved, Puki Puki's most resembles that of the common cuckoo, a classic evictor. It's said to lay its eggs in the nest of the Murno, and upon hatching the chick rolls the other eggs out of the nest to their doom, so it can be the only chick. Such behaviour is apparently rare among wyverns, and whilst this may sound hard to believe with the size disparity between the Murnos and the Puki Puki, all you have to do is look at the difference between a cuckoo chick and its adoptive parents to see that it's really not so outlandish. Murnos may be somewhat intelligent. They can be easily tamed and seemingly recognise their human owners. So surely they'd be able to spot a giant different egg in their nests and be able to just destroy it and double clutch that year. Well, maybe not if the parent Puki Puki have anything to say about it. With so many different types of cuckoo and brood parasite, it's no surprise that they also have a wide range of hosts. The great spotted cuckoo specialises in corvids, often magpies in their southern European breeding range. Corvids are very intelligent birds, and reasonably tough too. Sharing the same problem as Puki Puki, how does a cuckoo ensure they don't just fling their eggs out and start again? By forming an avian mafia. The cuckoos ensure the good behaviour of the magpies by destroying any clutch they try to make afterwards. They ultimately leave the magpies with no other option than to rear their chick. So despite their own reputation for trickery, it seems that magpies are really the ones living most of their lives inside a gangster's paradise. But of course, this hypothesis comes with some flaws when we try to apply it to Puki Puki. It assumes that Murnos would be smart enough to try and get rid of the Puki Puki egg to start with. And also it's possible this strategy only works as the great spotted cuckoo chick isn't an evictor, it leaves some of the magpie chicks alive for the nestling stage at least. But it can also be possible that if Puki Puki destroys enough nests, a population of Murnos may habitually allow its brood parasitism. So whether Murnos are smart enough to begin this behavioural arms race and the formation of a wyvern mafia is hard to say right now, but it remains interesting speculation. One of the attacks that can still catch hunters off guard is the spray of poison from Puki's tail. It's possible this may start quite early in life, and could be another trick shared by the Great Spotted Cuckoo. When threatened by a predator in the nest, Great Spotted Chicks exude a foul substance that is pretty universally repellent to any predator. In areas with high predation rates, this can astonishingly benefit the host species. Predators tend to eat the entire clutch, and whilst the presence of a cuckoo chick can likely result in a few of the chicks starving, it's still a net gain that some of them survive. Puki Puki's habit of spraying poison from the tail may come from birth, and it may be a vital trick to prevent predators thieving it in the nest. Whether or not it will ever achieve the borderline symbiosis great spotted cuckoos do with their hosts is impossible to say. As an evictor, it's not off to an especially good start to this as is. But it does show what a fascinating and advanced behaviour brood parasitism can be. Actually getting your egg into the nest of someone who doesn't want it there can be a bit of a problem, and so brood parasites use a suite of tactics. Some work as pairs, with the male distracting the nest owners so the female can lay. Some mimic predators to scare them away, and some use speed and simply blast the egg straight into the nest in a rush. This is the tactic Puki Puki is described as using, waiting for a small window in which to deposit the egg. For this reason, Puki Puki may have some of the thickest eggshells for any wyvern, potentially even possessing a sort of double shell like some cuckoos do. Speed layers often don't have a lot of time to perfectly position themselves for a gentle deposit, and being much larger than their hosts who often nest in thick or thorny vegetation, a lot of the time they can't even reach the nest itself. 
With speed being of the essence, they will often position themselves above the nest as best they can and just drop the egg from several inches above it. This can damage other eggs on landing, but the cuckoo embryo is safe inside with a thick shell. We don't see a mono nest in game, but with the size disparity between them and Pukey Pukey, it seems reasonable that building their nest in dense vegetation where Pukey may struggle to enter, or be too heavy to balance, may be an option. This, plus the short time window Pukey has to lay, means they may well have thick shells for the bombs away tactic. Even more garish than a common Pukey is the Coral Pukey Pukey. As the name suggests, it's a neon resident of the Coral Highlands where it presumably lives off the large numbers of coral eggs that attract great flocks of Rafinos. These Rafinos are almost certainly its host for the area too. The dietary change to swap from fruits and nuts to coral eggs may not be so massive. After all, fruits and fungi especially are fat and protein, which is effectively the same components as an egg on a very basic level. But it may indicate that this is a different race of pukey, more distinct than just outside colour and diet. Cuckoos can parasite a wide range of birds, but not every cuckoo can parasite every host available for their species. Within species of cuckoos there are races, and each race will have a different egg patterning suited to the host that its race has adapted to. It suggested the reason that some birds have such ornately patterned eggs is for better parasite rejection. Even if coral pukies can survive as adults outside of the highlands, their breeding success may be limited to that area only. Even if pukies could swap hosts at random, this is no guarantee of success either. Not everyone makes for a perfect host. Some animals have nests too steep for the chick to roll the egg out of, and upon hatching the parasite struggles to get enough food and often starves. Some may have eggs too large to roll out. Some may not feed their chicks regularly enough, or enough high quality food for them to sustain a parasite growth rate. Some animals instinctively refuse a parasite hatchling in their nest. This final point may be from some animals winning the evolutionary arms race. Some birds are believed to have been past hosts of cuckoos now free from their influence. It could be that they developed parasite rejection simply too good or ecological factors causing a drop in their abundance, making them unviable hosts, or something else entirely. Who knows, in the past, maybe there were volcanic pukey pukey in the Elder's Recess, or migratory alpine ones in the hoarfrost summers. The ancient forest in the New World overall may teem with species who are past veterans of pukey pukey in their tricks, who have successfully broken free. A final question one may have for brood parasitism in any species be it a real bird or a fictitious wyvern, is how does it come about? How does an animal wake up one morning and say, can't someone else do it, in regards to parental behaviour? Well, the exact reason isn't quite known, but there are several theories. One is that it evolved as a response to high rates of siblicide between the chicks. If your offspring keep killing each other in the nest, this doesn't result in especially good breeding success. So lighten the load by putting them in someone else's. Another could be that intraspecific brood parasitism, which is putting your eggs in the nest of someone else who is actually your species, is the stepping stone for such behaviour, and this is actually quite widespread in birds, with such behaviour having evolved independently across multiple families. It's not known exactly why this happens either, but it's suggested to start when a mother can't use her own nest for a variety of reasons. Maybe she didn't make one in time, or it was destroyed, or someone else is using it. So she lays her eggs in someone else's clutch. Another is that she doesn't necessarily go whole hog and lay the entire clutch, only some of them in other nests as an insurance policy. There is also a series of behavioural correlates often seen in conspecific brood parasites too. Maybe Pukey's ancestors had a similar life history to these species, a relatively social cavity nesting wyvern with high offspring fecundity. What began as laying their eggs in someone else's nest of their own species over time could be an evolutionary stepping stone for laying them in another species' nest. If you're desperate and don't have your own or another of your own species' nest, you go for the next best thing and find any good nest you can. Combine assorted selective pressures over generations and it may turn into brood parasitism. If this sounds a bit similar to the origins of someone else I've suggested in the past, there may be a reason for it. In Kezu and Giganox's video, I suggested them as deriving from social cave-roosting wyverns, possibly nocturnal too. Maybe this ancestor they actually share with Pukey Pukey. Adrian Thompson suggested this after the cave wyvern video. 
and even better supported it with his own great cladograms. He mentioned that the three wyverns are the only known ones to actively expel substances from their caudal regions, which is to say their tails. All three have muscular tails that they have great control over, that also derive a special use. Housing and feeding offspring, a suction cup or the ability to spray substances from it. It's hard to say which the ancient ancestor used it for, but it was possibly most similar to a smaller and basal version of Pukey. It then derived into the assorted wyverns we know today over millions of years, and different, unique environmental conditions. This is just one plausible headcanon for the evolution of these wyverns, and one I've personally bought into. It's worth noting how weird evolution can be, and how many animal lineages in our own world were flipped around with more advanced ways to detect ancestry. So who knows what the histories of the assorted wyverns could be if we could ever test them. Brood parasitism is something that's been suggested a few times for other wyverns. Gypsaros and Seregios, but chiefly Yangaruga. There isn't actually any canon to suggest this is true. If anything, Garuga more than likely predates Cuckoo when it can. But it also fits in with the asinine notion of animal morality. The dark, evil wyvern of course not caring for its young. This bird is a greater honey guide. It looks unassuming at most, and cute on a good day. But every adult specimen of this species will have several kills under its belt. Honey guides are also brood parasites, but their young are born with sturdy bullhooks that aren't for breaking out of the egg. Hatching naked, blind and heavily armed, they then kill all the host chicks by hacking them to death with their bill. All this not from a massive eagle, a feathered demon or a conniving corvid, but from a fluffy little songbird. As hopefully some of the points here have shown, Brood parasitism is complex, and not more or less moral than any other behaviour. Doing it doesn't make you dark or evil, and there are very few physical attributes to show it. It can only be discovered with observation. Animal families can always hold endless surprises, so who knows what other behaviours can be uncovered in the wyvern families of Monster Hunter. But Pukey Pukey doesn't just take from the residents of the ancient forest, he gives a lot back too possibly even more than most other residents. Some plants in the ancient forest seem semi-dependent on Pukey Pukey to germinate seeds, relying on them to break the outer shells and let them fall to the ground in foraging bouts. Other seeds are dispersed in Pukey Pukey dung, others still from him dropping them or possibly even caching them. This seed dispersal behaviour is seen in a lot of real animals, and very often in birds. By eating various forest fruits and defecating them out in other areas, they help plant new trees. The exact value of this behaviour can vary, as the seeds still require safe microhabitats if the birds drop them outside of forest areas. But bird-germinated seeds do seem to have better survival rates, and their actions can help strengthen forest stability and regeneration. Some birds do more than others though, and when burying their acorns as they're well known for, jays can have significantly better seed recruitment rates than other animals like squirrels. A large majority of new trees in rewilded forest areas in one study were pedunculate oaks, and the majority of these were believed to have been planted by jays. Almost half a forest was replanted by a single species, and the most glamorous corvid of them all. Pukey Pukey is well adapted for an arboreal lifestyle. Like parrots, he has zygodactyl feet. These, a prehensile tail and the wing claws, would all help him move about in the canopy of the giant trees of the ancient forest. His long tongue allows him to reach things on branches he's too heavy to access with just his mouth, and his eyes have amazing vision in low light and colour, helping him pick out the ripest fruits and nuts. All of this may seem like an idyllic life, sunbathing in the treetops, eating acai bowls and avoiding child support, and up until a few thousand years ago it probably was, but around that time was when a newcomer arrived to the ancient forest, Rathalos. This is likely the reason we only ever seem to see him on the ground. Pukey Pukey is well suited to handle the other predators of the ancient forest. Anjanath and Great Jagras can be avoided by keeping to the treetops. Toby Kadachi is likely a smaller prey specialist. And Nagakuga can be avoided with flight. If worse comes to worst, he can always spray the poison too. Rathalos no sells a lot of this with his aerial ambushes. Like a harpy eagle with a sloth, he can just snatch Pukey from the branches before he has a chance to use his poisonous spray. He can also flush him out of cover with fireballs, and Pukey would be dead meat if he ever tried to outfly Rathalos. 
Rathalos likely didn't specialise in hunting Pukey, when there was perfectly good Aptonoth and Kestodon on the menu, but their presence and abundance in the forest likely meant that there was occasional predation, and the threat of it was enough that Pukey's only real option was to move out of the canopies and into the thicker undergrowth area. But Pukey's problems with Rathalos don't end there. Big predators don't eat everything. Whilst opportunistically anything can be on the menu, a lot of the time they will ignore small and unprofitable prey. Especially avian predators where capture would be very difficult. So something like a goshawk will typically ignore something like a hummingbird. And the smaller bird can really take advantage of this. Hummingbirds will nest close to such raptors as it's believed the presence of the bird of prey makes corvids unwilling to raid their tiny nests. The corvids themselves are well within the weight range for an ideal raptor meal. The hummers closest to the occipiters experience significantly greater nesting success and offspring survival than ones far away, protected by the column of fear the predator casts over the area. Maybe something similar occurs in the ancient forest. Monos may nest as close as possible to Rathalos, who may be intimidating but probably isn't going to bother to try and eat one, and so this reduces the rates Pukey Pukey can parasitise their nests. The naturally cautious wyvern probably isn't going to be bold enough to risk an attack from a Rathalos, even for the innate desire to breed. The column of fear Rathalos produces over the canopy of the ancient forest may provide Murnos with good safe havens, where they're free from Pukey's parasitism. Between occasional predation, reducing breeding success, and limiting habitat use, the presence of Rathalos may really limit densities of Pukey Pukey in the ancient forest. This itself may have repercussions for the whole ecosystem. If Pukey Pukey's seed dispersal makes it an ecological engineer, then Rathalos may change the environment that is the ancient forest. In the ancient forests of the Great Lakes region, wolves do something similar. Their high predation rates on beavers can change the impacts they have. The wetlands beavers create with their dams typically disappear if they aren't maintained by the beaver, and through predation wolves can in turn allow succession to continue where it was once halted by wetland. And this isn't bad, it's just different. Wolf predation on beavers is an additive, which is to say it doesn't reduce their population. So rather, wolves don't prevent wetlands, they just change their formation. With wolves, only a handful of beaver ponds become permanent, and others will become part of a temporal mosaic of wetland and forest that shifts back and forth with the beavers and the wolves predating them. Something similar may occur with Rathalos and Pukey. By reducing Pukey's numbers and pushing them out of forest habitat, Rathalos may reduce their impacts as ecosystem engineers. Dead trees that fall aren't replaced, forest expansion slows or stops in some places, and sea dispersal is limited. This may prompt shifts of forest into more open areas that benefit Rathalos and the animals he eats as well. The ancient forest as we experience it, with its areas of coastal plain, may be part of the impact Rathalos had on colonising the ancient forest, turning it into a more varied mosaic of habitats over just pure rainforest. This in turn may also help other animals like Anjanath, but limit others like Toby Kadachi. Again, this isn't bad, it's just change. Nature has its ebb and flow, and the roles that ecosystem engineers and their top-order predators will play may just shape the lands they live in more so than other species. For my thoughts on Pukey Pukey, he's alright. I won't say I'm wild about him. He's a decent addition to the new world and an okay early level monster, but I'd be lying if I said I found him an especially memorable one, especially compared to the earlier bird wyverns. A lot of thought has gone into Pukey clearly, but I think he'd really benefit from having a few more environmental behaviours. If we could see him brood parasitise a nest, that would be really cool. His changing colour with other animals is also quite impressive, but I'll be honest and say I missed it quite a lot in the early gameplay, as I was often focused on the other monsters more. Fight-wise, he's fine, gear is a bit mediocre. Overall, he doesn't really do anything wrong and does reasonable things right. He just never really stood out for me personally. I guess it all just comes down to your own tastes, but at least he got his own video. And thank you for watching it. And a big thanks to Adrian Thompson for his cladogram and all the thought that went into it. Some of the binomial names for the Wyverns are also fantastic. Chameleopena Dryoterigiaps, the chameleon feather bound to the trees for Pukey Pukey. 
Borognathus furfodactylus, the glutton jaw with dishonest wings, is of course Kezu. And the blind tooth in the night, Malamogigi's Kesai, for Giginox. All great stuff, and I hope I didn't butcher those names too badly. From the comments, Ganon's Baker points out that Baroth's fire weakness, when the mud is shaken off, could well indicate that he's generally quite heat sensitive, and the mud wallows are vital for him to escape the hot daytime temperatures. Grant Owens came up with the great idea that with its dexterous tail, Almadron may be able to make dams and levees like a beaver, to better create permanent water bodies for itself. Baroth's nostrils were also brought up a bit, and many pointed out that they've moved to the top of his head, no doubt for easier breathing when submerged. Freaky Owl pointed out that they could be like the crests of some hadrosaurs, and act as reverberating chambers for its roars, which also amplifies them and gives them the echoing quality heard in older games. As ever, there were a lot of other great comments. I don't get the chance to respond to all of them, but please do keep them coming, they're great to see. For the first time in Monster Hunter's history, people were also asking, where's Jurotodus? And he was excluded as it really would have increased the video beyond the two week production time I had for it, if he was also in it. But I can assure you he'll appear in a future video. It won't be next week, as that'll be another break from Monster Hunter to explore something else. Despite the fact that we'll be looking into the future, you could well say that things will be getting a bit primeval.